Bonjour everybody, this is Q and today we're taking a look at the oscillating fan. Let's quickly check out where the oscillating fan comes from before explaining the theory of the mechanism. This will help us build the model and understand how it all works. So, while fans have been used since approximately 500 BC before Christ, let's focus on the actual older mechanical fan, so the ones using system, a mechanism to work. So, a, a pattern from the 27th of November 1830 shows the first depiction of an uh, automatic fan. It uses gravity from a weight to move a large sheet of paper and create wind. I think we can all appreciate the time and effort the inventor of this machine spent drawing the user of the fan. The first electrical fan was developed between 1882 and 1886 by Schwiller Wheeler. Pretty sure that's not the right way of pronouncing his name. Uh, anyway, before that, fans were powered by steam, oil, or even alcohol. The electrical fan quickly took over the market, but it had a main problem when used as a table fan, meaning used on the floor or on a table. It only covered one direction. In 1907, the first oscillating fan was made. At first, the engineer just added a split ball joint which allowed the fan to be manually redirected. It didn't take long for the engineers to actually create a system that we know today, and that swings the fan from side to side automatically. Today, oscillating fans have pretty exotic features, like, for instance, a heater to create a warm, thawing wind. But the mechanical principles stay the same, and that's the one we'll be taking a look at today. So, the main goal of our mechanism here is to transform the spinning movement of the shaft of the motor that makes the blades spin into a side-to-side -side rotation of the whole assembly. It is very important to not use another source of power. We do not want to use more electricity to create this rotation as it would obviously be more expensive and consume more. First part of our system will be the fixed body. This is the leg of the fan, what allows it to stand on a flat surface. This fixed body, as the name indicates, is fixed. We do not want the whole fan to rotate on the table, that would be a little bit impractical. On this fixed body, we'll place our rotating body. This body will be mounted with a simple pivot on the fixed body and will carry the motor and the blades as the main goal is to move the direction of the fan. The last part is the interesting part. We need to make a mechanism that links the rotating body to the fixed body and creates that back and forth movement. This mechanism uses very simple laws of physics and geometry. We'll also add a reductor to the system to reduce the rotation rate of the fan into the rotation rate needed for the oscillation of the fan. Finally, we'll take a quick look at the feature added to enable or disable this oscillation. Alright, let's start the exciting part now, modeling. As we explained in the theory of the mechanism, we'll start by doing the fixed body. Just before we start, I'd like to point out that I'm using Fusion 360 in these videos. The software is free for students and startups and very cheap for the full version. For me, this means everybody could start enjoying 3D modeling, especially when you'll see how straightforward it is to use it. I hope I can share with you the magic of 3D modeling and interest some people to start. I hope you'll enjoy this video. This component is straightforward, really. It's a simple revolution around the vertical axis. I added some details on the base because... Well, because I can. 
Next up, the rotating body. The pivot is simply represented by a cylinder on the fixed body. That's enough to create the joint that we'll make later in the video. This rotating body holds the motor and the blades. As you'll see, and that's why parametric 3D modeling softwares like Fusion 360 are powerful, we design all our components in context. This means the component's geometry references to other components' geometry. As we can see in this simple example, the cylinder coming out of the bottom plate tells us where and how big the circle, the hole, on the top plate is. And if we change later the cylinder size, the hole will adapt. This means the whole model and each step of the design can be modified at any moment. Mounted on the rotating body is the motor and the shaft. We represent it simpler than it is in reality, but that's plenty enough for us to understand how the mechanism works. We'll model the blades later in the video, directly on the shaft. We'll also add a thread at the back, and that's where our reductor starts. Before making this reductor, we need to explain why we use one and the basic principle behind it. The shaft of the motor that connects to the blades needs to spin relatively fast. Fast enough for the blades to create a cool wind, which is the point of the fan, isn't it? Problem is, if we connect the oscillating mechanism straight to the shaft, the fan will oscillate way too fast around the main axis. That's why we make a reductor. Reductors are very common in mechanical systems. So our goal here is to adapt the rotation rate, or called rotational speed, of the shaft to something slower to move the fan left to right. Quick note here, before doing the actual reduction, we've got a last step. The shaft rotates around the horizontal axis, and the fan rotates around the vertical axis. So first, we need to find a way to change the axis of rotation. A smart little system, also very common, the worm gear. I won't go into too much detail, but here's how it works. It uses a worm, which is a gear in the form of a screw, to mesh with a worm gear, very similar to the standard spur gear. This contraption acts as a reducer, but is mainly used because it can transfer motion in 90 degrees. Now, to the other part of the reducer. Gears are most commonly used for that, and they use a very simple mechanic. If you spin a small gear and transmit the speed to a larger gear, the larger gear will spin slower than the smallest one. The only requirement is that the modules are equal. So, for the last step of this reductor, and then I swear I stopped talking about reduction, let's see how to gain more reduction without using too much space. We're gonna use what we call a compound gear. I'll try to explain quickly how this works. It's very easy to calculate the reduction rate of gears of same module. One gear with 10 teeth, another one with 50 teeth. The reduction rate will be 50 over 10, so five. Meaning the second gear spins five times slower than the first one. If we want to add a third one, the reduction rate multiplies, meaning 5 times 5 equals 25. Problem is, it takes a lot of space. The compound gear means connecting a smaller third gear under the second one, and adding a fourth one at the end. This allows us to get the same reduction for much less space used up. Okay. Enough for reductors, there are many other types out there, but we'll get to talk about them in other mechanisms. Back to the video. I built the four gears we'll use in the reductor and use little platforms to carry them and move them with the rotating body. The gears were imported from a feature in Fusion 360 that lets you import any gear choosing all the parameters you want.
Now that we have a proper oscillating rate, we can start the oscillating mechanism. Before making an infusion, let's see quickly how it works. The base principle here is to use four levers that form what's called a four-bar linkage mechanism. This system is actually pretty commonly used in machines. Here is what it looks like on a pump jack, for instance, as well as in theory. Now that we know the theory we'll be using for the oscillation, we can start implementing it in our design. This part is actually very easy to model, it's just a few levers connected to each other. The length determines if the oscillation of the fan will be large or not. Just for the looks, uh, we'll be modeling the blades on the shaft coming out of the motor. We'll be using several planes tangent to the shaft's axis and draw a section of the blade on each plane. A loft and a circular repetition of the one blade concludes the modeling of the oscillating fan. We'll now add the feature we were talking about at the start of the video, the part that enables or disables the oscillation. This is actually very simple, again, and it consists just of a little stick that pulls the first gear up. By pulling this gear, we disconnect the bottom gears that oscillate the fan and therefore disable it. The last step is to add all the joints that make the mechanism actually move. We basically tell the software which part moves and which part is fixed. And there we have it, the oscillating fan. I really hope you learned something today and that you enjoyed the video. Feel free to give me any feedback on anything related to the video and I'll see you all in the next one.